Well, welcome everyone to the DAR Museum Online. Uh, I'm Sarah Kerspell. I am the Coordinator of Museum Engagement and Outreach. And just some quick housekeeping for those of you who haven't joined us before. Uh, if you have a question for our speaker, go ahead and pop that in the Q&A section. Uh, you'll see that down on the bottom of your screen. Uh, it helps keep our questions organized. So uh, I can keep an eye on those and I'll be able to answer them as we go. Or if uh, it's a question for our speaker, I will ask those to her at the end. So uh, all the questions that we have, I will be able to ask at the end. And uh, I will monitor that just to make sure nobody's left hanging. Um, and now that that's out of the way, welcome to our monthly Tuesday talks. Uh, this is presented the second Tuesday of the month, and it highlights topics related to the DAR Museum collections, from decorative arts to American social history and best practices in object preservation. For a full list of our upcoming lectures and programs, uh, please visit our website, www.dar.org museum or follow us on Facebook and Instagram at DAR Museum. We offer family programs, Girl Scout programs, symposia, exhibit tours, evening events, and more. Coming up this week on Saturday, we have the Lunar New Year Festival on the 17th. Uh, in March, we're hosting a Saturday morning cartoons program on the 23rd and a women's history costume party on the 30th. So if you're in the area, please plan to join us. Uh, and our next virtual program will be on March 12th, the Tuesday talk on the upcoming exhibition, Sewn in America, Making Meaning Memory, presented by our curator of of costumes and textiles, Alden O'Brien. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Carrie Blau. Uh, she is the curator registrar of the DAR Museum and has worked with the museum since 2014. Uh, previously, she was the curator at several museums and historical societies in Maryland and Pennsylvania. Uh, she is the curator of American-made earthenware, cooking equipment, textile processing equipment, firearms, militaria, tools, and the Native American collections. And she is from Maryland currently. Uh, so we will uh, turn that over. And Carrie, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the introduction. I appreciate it. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, uh, I'm glad you're all here. And I hope you're um, ready to hear about the red earthenware that we have in the museum collection. I, I'm approaching this a lot like I did the stoneware collection uh, in October, if any of you uh, tuned into that. Uh, it's just an overview. I just want to tell you all what we have and show you some pictures of it. So last spring, I took over as curator of the American Made Earthenware. Um, I saved working on redware for last because it's my favorite um, material to study. Um, I love it all, the, all of the earthenware, but um, American Made Earthenware, but but um, redware really is um, something I've been studying since the mid 1990s, and I uh, I just really enjoy all the variety of forms and decorating techniques, and so many stories to tell with the um, with the pieces. So I did manage to work a little bit uh, with the redware prior to taking over last spring um, here at the DAR Museum um, with the stuff that uh, was used for cooking, like uh, the the mold that you see in the middle and um, the, one of the little cups that was used for actually cooking. And so I did have a pretty good idea of what we have and what we did not have in the collection. Um, one of the biggest gaps in the collection was um, something made by Moravians in North Carolina. Um, and helping acquire a piece of a Moravian redware was one of the um, one of my first accomplishments with this collection, and we acqui acquired a Moravian fish bottle, which you'll see later on in the in this talk, and it really is superb. So now, after studying the collection for the last few months, I'm ready to share an overview with you all of what we have. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail about forms and styles and makers, um, but I'm going to tell you what we have, how it was decorated, and how we acquired it. And also, I'm going to end with how I want to expand the collection, how uh, what what we need to, to tell a more full story about uh, red earthenware in uh, the U.S. So, like the stoneware collection, I started by cataloging every single piece of the redware. And I did this by photographing everything, actually twice, because I didn't like how the first batch turned out. And I didn't realize that until after I had photographed 40 some pieces of redware. So I did it all again. <laughs> you know, you have to have good photos. So, but this this gave me um, the opportunity to examine every piece several times and um, create a condition report, measure them and um, really describe them. So this now includes, because I'm 
currently acquiring more pieces for the collection, 47 pieces of redware. And to give you some perspective, we have 52 pieces of stoneware. So we're very close in, in the amounts of both pieces. Um, so I, 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 I was able to create a little um, display this time. It's not as big as the space I got for the stoneware. So um, it's just uh, two shelves in the study gallery. But um, if you're in the area, I do encourage you to come out and see the stuff because we do have some very nice things in the collection. Um, it's a small space, so I included some of the smaller items um, in the Redware collection, um, but they are great to admire in person. Um, so let's begin by talking about what red earthenware is. Uh, it's often called redware. So I'll go back and forth between those two terms. They mean the same thing. So redware is first and foremost, it's a utilitarian product that was made. Um, and as you can see from the definition uh, from the Merriam-Webster that I put up here, this describes redware so perfectly because these things were made to be used, but they were also made for to be beautiful too. Um, but they were primarily used. And so redware is primarily considered to be utilitarian. Unlike Wedgwood, Staffordshire, and the other types of fancy ceramics, it, redware is both beautiful and useful, um, but it was made for use. And of course, there are beautiful pieces of redware. There are some show pieces, some fancy types, but by and large, the pieces were made to be used. They were consumed. They were um, eaten off of. They were cooked in and... Um, sometimes put on the roofs of their houses. So um, I think it's important to make this distinction about redware because it was made for different markets and for um, the more middle-class households uh, could afford this stuff. And because we know that these pieces were actually used, then we know what was being used, you know, for cooking, for serving. And, and that is important, I think, when we're trying to study the past and see what people were using in the, the study of material culture, we want to know what people actually used on a day-to-day -day basis. And they used redware a lot, the middle, middling kinds of households. Um, and the fancy ceramics were made to be looked at and sure used, you know, teacups and whatnot. Um, but I like to look at the redware pieces and I know that average people were using them. And I like that because I'm an average person too. And so uh, the majority of Americans are. So I like to, to study it for, that's one of the reasons. Um, so that's what redware is. It's this um, uh, material, it's clay that's dug from the earth and processed and um, made into something useful. And so then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the cataloging process. You know, we catalog all the collections that come into the museum. And as I explained in my stoneware talk a couple months ago, we describe everything and then we make them uh, what we say is web ready. We clean up the records so that they have the uh, measurements, a great description, a great photo, and as much information as we can about them so that researchers, so that people who are interested in it can come to our website and find it. And at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll provide a link so that you can all see how, to, how you can go and look at all the redware that we have. Um, because I did that, um, all of the redware is now web ready and you can go to our online database and search for it and, um, you'll find them all and you'll be able to um, look at them more in depth or see some of the things that I've talked about today and spend a little more time with them. So now we can talk a little bit about who made redware. And of course it's a potter um, and potters had their potter shops. And um, the tradition of making redware in this country is it's very English, Germanic and French in style and mainly Germanic in uh, the mid Atlantic area. Uh, the potters arrived from Europe uh, with the skills necessary to make this product right away. They were making it right away because they settled in places that had a great source of clay and wood for firing the kilns. And they settled throughout the colonies. They worked either as full-time potters in um, more urban areas, more populous areas, or the trade could have been a supplement to farming in more rural areas. And we see that a lot um, with some of the redware potters. Um, and we we generally look at redware along the lines of New England, um, Pennsylvania German, uh, Shenandoah Valley, North Carolina, some of the main regions that we see it being made in, but there's many other regions too. Um, but those are the big ones. And discussing potters, who they were and where they came from is a whole very involved topic on its own. And that's enough for a dedicated lecture or several. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details about it now. And we do not have um, very many uh, identified redware 
potters in our collection. And that's that's something I hope to fix. So as I mentioned, they set up shop where they could find the um, clay and the wood. Um, and the clay is red. It gets its color from the iron that's in the clay. And so based on the region, you see different um, shades of red. And you'll see all of these variations in our collection as I go through our conversation today. And redware pot bakers, that's another term for potters that you see often in inventories and newspapers, um, they produced for local markets mainly. Um, and so the next part I want to talk about is how redware was made. Um, there's two main methods for making these um, materials um, that potters made. It could either be um, molded or thrown on a wheel, which I'm sure you're both familiar with seeing a potter at a wheel as I uh, have a, an image on the screen here for you to see. Um, and we have collections that fall into both of those categories. And there's there's variations within both of those categories too. So we'll talk about a few of those. So this is something that's called drape molding. Um, they're molded over something and, and pressed and flattened. And this is just a dish, just a very shallow dish. Um, baking was done in these dishes. Uh, food preparation, um, serving was done in, with these dishes. They were used for multiple um, uh, multiple um, purposes. And uh, it was just sort of flattened over a mold and just pressed onto it. And um, there you have your shallow form. Um, another type of molding is uh, hand molding. This little duck up here in the corner, he's very small. He's only about two inches high. And these cat banks are about three and a half inches high. Um, the duck mold was hand formed. And then the cat molds were put into a two piece bank, sometimes three piece um, mold and pressed into it and allowed to dry. And so then um, those are the two different types of molding that we have. And then of course, everybody has heard of uh, wheel thrown pieces. And we have a variety of pieces, a lot of pieces in the collection that have been thrown, like this large jar uh, with the lug handles on it. it um, it's, it's rather large, it's about um, 13 inches high. And then we have this mug, which is of course, regular mug height, about four inches. And then this jug was also formed on a potter's wheel. And then this little salt cellar was also formed on a potter's wheel. So these are some of the mold thrown um, or the wheel thrown objects in our collection. And so when we start talking about the redware, I like to talk about the um, categories and classifications. What exactly do we have? What categories and classifications do they fit into? And all of the stuff that we have is for household use um, because we are a museum of the home. So we do like to talk about things that were used in the home and these things definitely were. And if you heard my stoneware talk, you know I'm a stickler for calling things by their proper names. Uh, and I use the, um, the preferred history museum nomenclature, which is Chanel's, and I, I talked about that last time too. But if we're all talking about the same thing, if we're all calling it the same thing, then we all know we're talking about the same thing. And um, then there's less confusion and we try to be specific and um, clarifying of what we have and what we call these things. So if we call them by the proper names to begin with, then um, we're in good shape. So we do have a lot more varieties of redware than we have of stoneware. And that that makes sense because there were a lot more varieties of things made um, of redware. It, it didn't fire at as high of a temperature as stoneware and it was a little easier to make and manipulate. So, um, but all kinds of common household goods could be made from this material. And these redware potters were making, as I said, primarily household goods. That was the bulk of their products, but they made stuff for the farm. Um, they made stuff for taverns, mugs and pitchers and stuff for taverns and stores for shops also. They also made roof tiles and bricks. That's why I said earlier, some people even put it on the roofs of their houses. And a lot of these roof tiles are still, um, you can find them in museums. <laughs> and the redware that we have is primarily from the 19th century. Um, we have a few pieces that are from the late 18th century. And the latest thing we have is, uh, was made around in the 1860s, probably the late 1860s. And the most common form we have are, of course, jars, just like the stoneware. But 
we have a lot of jars because there were a lot of jars made. They were so versatile and they were so common in homes and needed for so many different things. Um, in Pennsylvania, a well-known redware state, um, they were used to hold, a lot of them were used to hold apple butter. You see dozens and dozens of them in household inventories and potter's inventories uh, uh, and day books for apple butter jars uh, because apple butter was a hot commodity. And you see maple syrup jars, them, them called maple syrup jars or molasses jars, um, but they did hold all kinds of kitchen goods. Um, and so you see them listed all over the place and described and um, they, they were just everywhere. Um, and the next most common form we have are dishes. And this is a pretty generic term, I know that, but they're often qualified like baking dish or loaf dish. And it has a variety of purposes. Um, but it is a simple form or shape. I showed you the two drape molded dishes earlier. But here I'm going to show you a, a scrolling list of all the forms that we have, uh, all the different types of forms, basins, baking dishes, banks, uh, some colanders, uh, figures. We'll see some of those later. A uh, batter jug, um, a little flask, and um, the flower pot. We, we have a, a, an interesting variety of items in the collection. And let's look at a few photos of some. So first we have this dish. Um, this one is actually on display in the Wisconsin room. So some of these items are on display in the period rooms too. So if you if you come to the museum and have a look around, you'll find some like the Oklahoma kitchen. Of course, uh, the Wisconsin room has some and that might be it. So two. Um, then here is another jar, and this is a very nice one. It has a very interesting glaze on it, and we'll talk about glazes in a bit. And this is a cheese mold or a colander. It could have been used for both. Um, and uh, another mug. This is actually a pretty tall mug. This is about six and a half inches high, and it's also on display in the Wisconsin room. And then we have this little um, dish. This dish is interesting because it was used over the fire. I did a talk a few years ago about the redware that we have in the collection that was used to cook things over a fire. It was actually um, used right in a fire and you can tell, you'll see some examples. It has a very black bottom on it. So, so these are some other forms that we have in the collection. And as you can see, these are all pretty modestly decorated. But the, the next subject I wanna talk about is the decoration and the glazing and sealing of redware. Like all earthenware, if it was going to be used in a kitchen, it likely needed to be made waterproof and um, a glaze was needed to do that. And it, um, it needed to be made non-porous so that you could drink out of it or eat out of it and it wouldn't um, absorb that. Um, so after a piece has been um, molded or turned, as I explained earlier, it's allowed to dry to a leathery stage called greenware. And then at this point, it can be decorated. Um, a light cream slip could be applied and then a decoration scratched into it called scraffito um, or slip decorated like the dish. Um, it, it can be applied with a slip cup or a brush. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, the different types of slip designs. Um, once coated in slip, as I mentioned, some things can be scratched. It's called scraffito. And um, also minerals can be applied to create colors. You see this mug has some brown on it. Um, if you use copper, you get green. If you use iron, you get black. And manganese creates a variety of browns. And then finally, these pieces are coated in a lead sealing glaze. And I know what you're thinking, lead? Yes, colonists knew that lead was bad for them. They knew as early as the 1780s, but they also uh, knew that uh, they needed this lead-based glaze to make it non-porous, and it was the best and most accessible material for it. So um, after it was decorated, a uh, glazer seal was applied to it, and then it was fired in a wood-fired kiln. And that could sometimes take up to a week to make sure that it got up to the temperature for the length of time it needed to, to make it into this vitreous material. But the lead um, uh, colonists knew this, and so they wouldn't use vinegar with it because that would make it react more. And they they had they they had had ways to try to mitigate it, but they were aware of it. So now we'll talk a little bit about the different types of decorations that um, we have in our collection. So as I mentioned, scraffito, it is by far the coolest decorating style. I mean, you scratch stuff into it; 
into this um, slip. It's like a kale and uh, clay, a pipe clay. Um, you could brush it on and then scratch this decoration into it and add other colors. And you can read the decor or the, the definition of sgraffito here. Um, this was very common among the Pens Pennsylvania Germans. Um, and we did not have any examples in the collection of this style that was so very common until January when we won a piece at auction. And I'm sorry for the, the bad photo. This is the only one I have of it because it hasn't arrived yet. It just shipped yesterday. So as soon as it does come in, I'm gonna put it on display and then it'll be cataloged also and it'll be in our um, online database. And so my goal is to add more pieces of this because uh, it was such a common technique. Um, but scratching could also be done on other things without the background of, uh, without the slip on first to scratch away and make a decoration. So this is just scratched with a pointy tool. Um, and this is a ring fat flask, probably central Pennsylvania. And um, it also has a manganese and copper uh, glaze on it too, to highlight these um, these etchings on it that give it a, a really unique appearance. And this I purchased for the collection last year, last uh, spring or summer. So as I mentioned slip um, with a slip cup is another way to decorate. So a, a slip cup is this um, fist sized cup made out of clay and it has a spout. It's just a really humble kind of tool that this um, really thin pipe clay was put in and these squiggles could be made um, with a deft hand. And then uh, the the dish, the larger dish on the lower right, uh, a potter would hold that and then turn it on the wheel as it turned, you know, move his hand a little bit to make this squiggle line. So as it was turning, you could get these concentric circles and these squiggly lines, nice and even on the piece if you have a steady hand. Um, and then some very vibrant decorations can be made with the the minerals that I explained uh, about the iron, the copper, the manganese. And so the on the left is a flower pot and the flower pot is a five and a quarter inches high. And um, it's probably from uh, Virginia, from the Strasburg area of Virginia. And then the ointment jar on the left is really small. Uh, this is a very misleading picture, my apologies. It's only about three inches high, but they look like they're about the same. But I wanted to make the picture as big as possible so you could see all the details of the the um, interesting leaves and flowers that are uh, made with this, uh, with these um, minerals. Uh, another way to decorate is to use uh, small tools that you really could find anywhere. If you look on the lower right, that band around is like a, a coggled band around the um, body made with something like a pie crimper, something, something like that. Um, little blades, little tools, just to give it some interest. And of course, both of these have manganese on them and then a lead, um, lead-based glaze over top. And um, then things could also not be decorated at all. This is kind of a trick because this is a bean pot. And while it looks like it has a black glaze on it, like maybe iron or something, this is all from being uh, used in an oven. This is a bean pot. And you can see on the top that, you know, it is glazed on the interior and it would have been, you know, covered with something and then cooked for hours and hours and hours in a in an oven. And that's what creates this um, blackened um, patina around the top of it. And the outside is unglazed, but okay, so that was kind of a trick. So this is actually something that's just coated with a clear lead glaze. Um, and we have quite a few things in the collection like that. I just like this little guy and his little feet. Do you see how it's turned up? at the bottom left over there. It's very adorable. Okay, so how did we get this collection? I like to talk about that too. Um, you know, it's kind of provenance of the, the collection. Um, and most of it, like the stoneware, most of it has been donated to the museum. Um, 28 of these items have been gifts to the museum. Um, and the earliest piece to be donated was this dish that we saw earlier. It was donated in 1924. It's number 1687. And I love this piece. I think this is a, a, a great piece in our collection. It is has been used. It has been used and loved. Um, but I, I love to see this kind of evidence on something that was so beautifully decorated too. This is the very definition of utilitarian. It was made for beauty, but it was used and used a lot. 
So then the other 18 items in the collection um, have been purchases. Uh, so the, the next, um, uh, the purchases were made between 1963 and 1985. And then again, when I started purchasing stuff for the food processing collection and um, in 2019 and until the present, present. Actually, last week I got another piece, so I'm very excited about that. Um, the most recent acquisition, it, 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 it arrived last week, but it needs to be cleaned. It's a fat lamp. It's a redware fat lamp, but it needs to be cleaned. So I can't take a good photo of it now because I want to clean it up first. But once I do get that clean, it's going to go in the study gallery in my case too. And um, it will be available to be found online as well. So check back to our online database. We're always adding things to it. So since those new these newest things aren't available for photographs to show you, I'm going to show you then the third most recent things. These cat bands. I just love these little guys. They combine two of my favorite things, cats and earthenware. Look at them. They're just adorable. Little collars. Love them. So then I, I do like to talk about some of the more important pieces. I mentioned that we acquired this Moravian fish bottle and um, it took some doing, but we were able to acquire it and we are so fortunate. It's just in fantastic condition. I wanted, I, sh I have the smaller picture in the corner so that you can see how small it is. It's very tiny, um, you know, with my hands for some perspective, but it, it is a really beautiful piece. Um, the Moravians really had some great style. Um, and in their one of their main potter shops in, in Salem, they did use the skill and labor of an enslaved potter known as known by the name of Peter Oliver. Um, so there are some interesting articles written about him too. And then I love this porringer. I, this is probably one of my favorite pieces because it's just so um, such a workhorse in a kitchen. This was used over a fire. It's black on the bottom. And, um, you know, you see porringers out of all kinds of materials. We have cast iron, we have silver, we have pewter. They're just, they're just made from so many different things. And I, I love this redware one. Okay, so I didn't do this for the stoneware collection and I regret it. But I want to include the most adorable piece of redware that we have, okay? So bear with me. Now I know I said the cat banks are adorable and they are, but this is also adorable. Okay. It's a duck and a beret wearing rooster. Now it's probably not a beret. It's probably the rooster's comb, but you can't not see a beret now, right? Um, they were made around 1840 um, by John Bell, who was born in Hagerstown, but was working in Waynesboro, PA. And these guys are really small. They're like about two inches high. So they're very tiny and they are just absolutely adorable. They're on display. So you can come in and have a look at them. And then I felt bad for not including the most adorable piece of stoneware. So here you go. I think this is the most adorable piece of stoneware. Look at this, look at this tiny little barrel pretending to be a big barrel. I mean, it's just adorable. It's only like five and a half inches long. So he's just, you know, he thinks he's a big barrel. So anyhow, back to the redware. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what uh, what plans I have for the redware collection, what, what I'd like to add to it. And why? Um, we need more representation of Scrofito. That stuff is really cool, right? Um, it was so common, we should have more representation of it. Um, we have a few pieces with some colorful decorations, which I showed you, but I think it would be great to have more of that because it was so common. And um, I'd like to ha have things with um, some images of people, uh, floral and fauna um, activities. You, you find those on uh, Redware. I would also like to acquire some pieces with more solid attribution um, as to the maker. And, and that can be difficult because it wasn't always signed. It was often not signed, but there are known pieces out there by makers. So um, I would like to find some of that for us. And then themes. I'm always looking for themes um, and commonalities in, in the collection. For instance, with the redware, I can already see a theme of baking. Um, we have storage jars, mixing bowls, baking dishes, and as you see here, a um, ring mold. So I'd also like to acquire items that speak to measuring grains and liquids because measuring, we all know in the kitchen is very important. So I, I like to find themes because that is something to interpret then, that is something to talk about. And uh, we can talk about how these things were used then. And I, I, I find that the most interesting and um, valuable information um, is to find out how these things were used, who was using them, and um, 
for what purposes. So now we've reached the end and I thank you so much for sticking around and listening to me. I hope I didn't talk too fast. I do tend to do that when I get excited and I'm always excited about Redware. So um, thank you so much for listening. Um, I wanna tell you what uh, a little bit about what I have in mind next. We do have some other earthenware that needs uh, attention, um, yellowware, rockingham ware. Um, but I I'll, I'll get to that and probably have some talks about that and how it relates to the redware and, and um, the industrialization of pottery in America. And so I'll explore some of those themes also. So, but now I feel like is a good time for some questions, right, Sarah? Yes, we so we have a couple in the Q&A already. And if you have thought of one during the talk, go ahead and pop it in there. Um, but Julie wants to know, she said, did you say cat banks, B-A-N-K-S? And do I they did have a say purpose other than being cute? <laughs> Um, yes, I did say cat banks. I should have shown you a photo of the back. There's a slot in the back for coins. And these these guys don't often survive because they had to be broken to get the coins out. So we're lucky that these two survived. And um, if you go to our website, if you go to, um, oh, oh yeah, I did put it, collections.dar.org, and you put in Redware, um, you will find those cat banks. And you can see the photo of the back that shows the... Um, the slot. Um, the next question was about the rooster with the beret on. Um, how did he, how did the redware get white for the rooster? You know, I mentioned that kaolin uh, pipe clay that was used on a uh, scraffito. That's what he's glazed with. Oh, so he's, he's red underneath and covered in yes. that white. Yeah. Excellent. Um, now, what can you tell us about spatterware? Uh, Jane has a round container with a lid. Um, spatterware is one of those, um, as, as I mentioned at the end, we have some other things. Um, it's not something I'm able to talk about. I, I haven't spent much time researching spatterware. So I would recommend looking for some books on it and, and finding out more about it that way. All right. Uh, now, Deborah wants to know, how are you able to identify the individual potters to the piece? Ah, if they're signed. That's really the main way, you know, um, I said we had some John Bell pieces and they are stamped John Bell. And um, and then some pieces are decorated so distinctly that you know this has to be such and such potter. So that's why it's really hard to identify them because they were rarely signed, but potters did have very um, particular, some potters did have very particular styles. Uh, this is my own edification. Would a potter work in various mediums or was he just like a redware guy and he didn't dabble in stoneware? Mostly a redware potter just did redware because it was such a, a, a vast difference in the firing techniques and glazing techniques uh, from stoneware that you're, you had a, you needed a completely different kiln for it. So they, it didn't transfer very easily. I mean, the skills did of turning something on a wheel. That is the same skill. Um, but it was the firing. So that's why there wasn't much, you know, doing both at the same time. Got it. Uh, do we have any, uh, Gail wants to know if we have any pig, pig banks in the collection. No, I wish we did. Oh, I wish we had a pig bank. Those things are fabulous. They mm -hmm. often have little sayings on them. Yeah, they're fun. And uh, Penny would love to know if you have any idea of the date on that uh, ring mold, on the bunt cake mold. Probably 19th century, probably about 1840s, 1830s. The, the most recent one I just showed. This right. one, I'm assuming. Okay, yeah. And uh, Cynthia would like to know, what is Rockingham Ware? That's um kind of an, uh, more of an industrially produced redware, or um, earthenware. And um, it's, it's a specific style, and that's a whole other topic. Um, so... Do we have any in the collection? We do. And I do. I will eventually get to that. But as I mentioned, it's not my favorite. <laughs> but I will get to it. <laughs> It'll be in the other other um, yes. collection <laughs> as assigned. Correct. Uh, Sherry would like to know, you mentioned redware roof tiles. That's hard to say fast. Uh, yeah, used yeah. for buildings. Are there any buildings that you know of where that could be seen today? I think there are. Um, but I can't think of where they are. There are still uh, potters who will produce that for um, certain historic houses and stuff. And they are very durable. 
They're very durable roofs. If you just Google redware roof tiles, you might be able to find some examples. They have this um, curve on them. You'll see it's very distinctive. Is it limited to a specific region where that would work? I would imagine it couldn't be somewhere that's too cold because they would crack. Well, Is if that... they're glazed, you know, and they, okay. they you know, uh, they were used uh, all over the, wherever they were making redware. But I think uh, a lot they're in the Northeast. different from terracotta as well, right? They're not yes. the curved little terracotta yeah. tiles. Yeah. Okay. Um, Cynthia would also like to, or different Cynthia, wow, uh, would like to know, are there any potters currently producing types of redware? Yes, yes. Like uh, reproductions of um, 18th and 19th century redware. Yes, there are some really great ones out there. And again, if you do, if you do want to see some, um, can you see my, I, I don't know, I have some pieces of some reproduction stuff on my, uh, my shelf here. Uh, it's S and J Potter is one of them that makes some really nice stuff. And then, but if you Google reproduction redware potters, you would find some. Okay. I think that's all the questions that our audience had. It seemed like everyone was very interested and had a lot uh, that they wanted to know about. Did you want to give a plug for your next talk potentially? No, no. Okay. I'm not entirely sure what it's going to be. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Carrie's got quite a variety of collections that she is responsible for. So she's always trying to decide uh, which one to feature next and which one yeah. to, to talk about. I think it's going to be about powder horns, but. You, well, you're not locked into that. I'm not locked into it. Yeah. Yeah. But again, if you um, have any more questions, you can email me, please. Yes, and uh, Carrie's email is there on the screen. You can also email museum at dar.org anytime if you have questions about an item that you have or anything uh, anything like that. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. We uh, will get this recorded and put up on the web, on our YouTube so you can watch it again and again and again. Uh, but thank you, Carrie, and thank you everyone for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day.